Ann-Sofie Näslund står därmed CNNs politiska reporter Ryan Novels eh, och som säkert vet mycket, mycket mer än vi om det här amerikanska valet. Ja, precis. Jag tänkte vi skulle börja prata med honom på en gång här och se vad han tror om eh, i natt. So, um, Donald Trump, <laughs> always this man, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, last week he ended up second in, in Iowa, even though all the polls show that he was going to win. What right. do you think about tonight and how important is it that he's going to win tonight? Well, you know, we thought he was going to win Iowa and he didn't. We think he's going to win New Hampshire. Uh, and I think that we can rely on the polls a little bit better in New Hampshire than we could in Iowa. It's always difficult to poll a caucus because of the investment in time that it requires. Uh, New Hampshire is a much more traditional voting situation here, uh, so it's kind of easier to pin people down. You know, the biggest uh, variable that we have here is that there are so many undecided voters. I mean, as late as yesterday, we were talking about 30 percent of the electorate maybe not knowing who they were going to vote for. But it seems as though those undecided voters were probably going to break in a bunch of different directions. And Donald Trump's 30 percent of the vote looks like it's going to hold on. Of course, we won't know until the polls close. Uh, but to your point, if he doesn't win, mm. if somehow we are surprised again, that could be a serious blow to his campaign, one that he may not be able to recover from. But if things go according to plan and he wins here big, I think we once again see the resurgence of Donald Trump and he becomes the dominating story of this uh, campaign. Right. Another person that we've been talking about a lot this week is Marco Rubio. Mm -hmm. He did great, or he ended up third, uh, a lot better than when most people expected in, in Iowa. But then he did a debate that wasn't his best moment. How much do you think that debate affected his chances tonight? You know, when I watched the debate Saturday night, it was a cringeworthy moment. And, and you thought to yourself, that's not the Marco Rubio that we've come to uh, see here on the campaign trail. But he had so much momentum, he thought, you know, he'll be able to shake this off. But after being here in New Hampshire for a couple of days, it's clear that his momentum has been stunted. Uh, you know, uh, 24 to 48 hours ago, it looked like the establishment, a wing of the Republican Party, was ready to kind of coalesce behind him. But now all of a sudden you're hearing about people talk about John Kasich, the governor of Ohio. You're once again hearing people say that perhaps Jeb Bush could come pull off some sort of miraculous comeback. Uh, so I think, if anything, um, we're learning that this is going to be a long process. We're not going to decide who the Republican nominee or the Democratic nominee is going to be anytime soon. But the difference between Iowa and New Hampshire for Marco Rubio is, as you alluded to, uh, he had very low expectations in Iowa and did much better than we expected. Here, his expectations are relatively high. Yeah. You know, he, he pretty much needs to come in second place in order to consider this a victory. Uh, if he doesn't, he won't be giving a victory speech uh, coming in third or fourth place as he did in Iowa. Right. But do you think, because uh, I, I guess a lot of people here in, in New Hampshire watch the debate. Do you think they are disappointed in him or does it not affect his, his chances, the debate? You know what I think it is? And, and having been here for a couple of days and talking to a lot of these New Hampshire voters, they take this responsibility so seriously mm. to be one of the first vetting Uh, the levels of the vetting process yeah. for these candidates, they want to be behind the winner, yeah. right? That's almost more important to them than picking the best guy. They, they th I think they kind of view those things as one and the same. Whoever we mm. pick is going to be the best guy. Uh, and so when all of a sudden Marco Rubio showed a, a degree of, uh, you know, if there were some issues with his campaign, that's when they started to kind of second guess it. You know, maybe this isn't the alternative to Donald Trump that we were looking for. And that sent them shopping to other candidates. You know, I talked to a guy yesterday at a Chris Christie event, and he said, I really like like Marco Rubio, but you know, I've also, I like Chris Christie a lot, and I like John Kasich. Uh, and so they, I think they seem really conflicted about all these anti-Trump candidates, mm. which has actually been to Donald Trump's benefit, because there are so many other candidates that he's able to kind of lock down, you know, 30% of the vote, and that might be enough to win. Right. Is there, um, is there any, you, you mentioned um, uh, Jeb Bush, and you, you mentioned um, John um, Um, John Kasich. Kasich, yeah. yeah. Um, do you think, and, and Chris Christie, um, Chris Christie, uh, is there anyone between them that you think are going to surprise tonight? Well, uh, I think that the one best positioned is Jeb Bush because his uh, his expectations have been so low. Yeah. You know, he's been so low in the polls for a long time and it seems like in the last 24 to 48 hours we've seen kind of an uptick in momentum for him. He's gotten relatively big crowds across New Hampshire and the polls show that he's doing very well uh, or doing better than what we expected. Uh, you know, I I kind of get the sense that this is the end of the Chris Christie campaign. You know, he, he's already said that he's got a plane ticket to South Carolina, mm. but that's just a lot of talking before the votes close. If he finishes somewhere in the range of 
three to five percent, it's going to be very difficult for him to make an argument to his donors that he moves on to South Carolina. You know, John Kasich, I think the expectations are now kind of up there. People, he started to surge about a week ago. So if he does anything uh, worse than third place, that's probably going to be a disappointment for him. So if you're looking for a surprise, uh, Jeb Bush may be the surprise, you know, barring the Donald Trump not winning. That yeah. would be the biggest surprise. Yeah. 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 Right. And Jeb Bush, he really needs it too. Yeah. yeah. But the thing about Jeb Bush is he's probably stronger in South Carolina than he is in, right. in New Hampshire. Yeah. So he needs to do well here, but he doesn't, you know, he could, unless he's, you know, near, near the bottom of the polls, if he finishes somewhere uh, between third and fifth, that's enough for him to make the argument that he can move on to South Carolina. Mm, right. And on the uh, Democratic side, it's just the two of them still there now after Martin O'Malley uh, dropped out. So it's uh, between Bernie Sanders and, and Hillary Clinton. And Bernie Sanders is the front runner by, by far in all polls. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's he, he's going to take it? Or, or is there any doubt about that tonight? Yeah. The big difference between the Republican polls and the Democratic polls, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders has had a consistent lead since, uh, you know, basically the summer in yeah. New Hampshire. And the big thing that we saw a big difference in is that the Democratic voters seemed settled on that. Mm. There wasn't as much uh, uncertainty amongst them. You know, they said they were voting for Bernie Sanders and they felt confident that that's who they were uh, going to continue to support. You know, the big problem for Bernie Sanders is he has set his own level of expectation so high. I mean, there have been polls that show him up by 30%. Yeah. So that actually kind of plays into Hillary Clinton's benefit. You know, she can talk about how Bernie Sanders is from a state that is uh, right next door to New Hampshire. Uh, and she can talk about about how kind of the deck was stacked against her in New Hampshire. And so if she comes within 10%, it's all of a sudden going to be this huge monumental comeback for her. Mm. You know, a lot. Of, I heard another commentator say this earlier, uh, that her husband uh, was declared the comeback kid here in New Hampshire when he first ran back in 1992, and he lost the state by nine points. So like we talked about in Iowa, you don't have to win to be a winner. <laughs> right. So so you think we're going to, uh, unless she, she lost by far, you think we're going to have uh, hear a, a, a victory speech from from Hillary Clinton? Yeah, I mean, as I well. think that I, you know, I think she's going to be ready to move on. Yeah, but I think she will if she has if she has if she has stronger support than what we're expecting. You can bet she's going to talk about how they overcame insurmountable odds to to you know defeat the guy from right next door, and you know we're ready to move on to South Carolina. And, you know, she's already talking about Michigan. You know, she was in Michigan over the weekend. That primary is not until March sixth. Mm. You know, the Clinton team is playing a long game here. They can do that because they have the money and the infrastructure. Uh, and so uh, the Democrats, it's going to be, uh, it's going to take us a while to figure out who the nominee is there. Mm. And, and obviously, if, if, if Bernie Sanders win, and, and that what we, that's what we think right now is going to happen, uh, I, I guess that's going to have a lot of impact on how he puts his, his campaign together for, for the rest of this, this trail. What, what do you think is going to, how is he going to use this and what's going to happen with him? Well, the big thing he's going to have to do now is he's going to have to pivot and reach out to some of the uh, minorities uh, in the Democratic Party, especially in South Carolina. You know, maybe 60% of the vote is African American in the Democratic mm. primary in South Carolina. And that's an area he's really weak right now. Right. You know, Hillary Clinton is really strong in that area. So, you know, you're going to see him talk a lot more about criminal justice reform. You're going to see him talk about how. You know, his central campaign issue of income inequality, how that impacts the African-American community uh, disproportionately. Um, you, you know, in predominantly white states like Iowa and New Hampshire, he hasn't had to target that message as much. As we move on to South Carolina and then uh, the big Super Tuesday uh, with all those southern states, Georgia, Texas, Virginia, he's going to have to even reach out more to African-American voters. And he's going to really have to pick away, you know, kind of institutional support that the Clintons have going all the way back to the to Bill Clinton's presidency. And that's not going to be any easy task. That's why, you know, even though Bernie Sanders has done very well, much better than anybody expected, he still has a long way to go before we can yeah. even begin to talk about him being the Democratic nominee. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going right. to talk to you uh, later tonight. I when can't we, wait. We'll, we'll actually have some numbers to talk about. <laughs> yes, exactly. See how wrong, right and how wrong we were. Uh, right, exactly. Well, the one thing we know is the biggest thing you shouldn't do is predict this election. So. That's right. We learned that last time. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Ja, det där var alltså Ryan Noble som är CNNs politiska reporter och expert och kommentator. Vi får se, vi kommer tillbaka till honom om några timmar här i New Hampshire när vi har resultatet. Så får vi se då hur rätt vi hade i våra, i vår, när vi spådde resultatet i natt. Och ja, då vet vi mer då helt enkelt. Tack så mycket för den rapporten, Ansvin Aslund med oss direkt alltså.